Engleski istraživač i autor David Icke već se preko četvrt stoljeća bavi proučavanjem procesa koje oblikuju naše društvo. Napisao je desetak knjiga u kojima je postupno otkrivao sve dublje veze nevidljive na površini, a koje su mu govorile da se zbivanja oko nas, kako u prošlosti, tako i danas, ne zbivaju nasumično, već su dio nekog dugotrajnog vođenog plana. Na tom mjestu stvari postaju i čudne, no u temelju mnogih manipulacija nalaze se naša uvjerenja o tome što svijet jest. A o podretlu tih uvjerenja rijetko kada razmišljamo, mara se na njih oslanjamo kada donosimo zaključke i odluke. U knjizi Fantomski ja, David Aik bavi se upravo tim pitanjima, pa smo ne po prvi put sastanak dogovorili ovdje, na rubu znanosti. Večer, Davide, i lijepo vas je opet imati sa nama. Great to be back. I've, I've, um, I've spoken in um, Croatia many times and it's always been a pleasure. Eto, nakon deset godina od prvog intervjua, uh, napisali ste knjigu koja se zove Phantoms koja. Pa krenemo odmah od naslova i pogledamo kuće nas to sve odvesti. Well, um, my, um, my contention is, and I think it's pretty obvious when you look at the world, is that the vast overwhelming majority of people are living a fake self-identity. Um, and this is being systematically manipulated to, in effect, hold our sense of reality only in the, the realm of the five senses, uh, which is a very, very, almost laughably narrow band of frequency that we're interacting with reality uh, upon. Um, for instance, um, according to mainstream science, the electromagnetic field, uh, electromagnetic spectrum, is 0.005% of what exists in the universe. If you look um, at a graph of the electromagnetic spectrum, you'll see a tiny little sliver in the middle of it called visible light. That is all humanity can see. Um, and if you can focus people's attention only in that realm of visible light and the world of the five senses, which basically says, can I see it, hear it, touch it, taste it, or it, it must exist then. And if I can't, well, it can't exist. Well, actually, the entirety of existence, um, almost, the, almost the entirety of existence, we can't see and we don't interact with. And what I'm saying is that we, uh, in our true uh, and infinite Uh, self are simply awareness we are a state of being aware when near-death experiences uh, leave the body um, when when the body dies briefly they tell a constantly common and recurring story that they were outside the body but they could see they could and not only could they perceive their um, awareness massively expanded into multiple levels of reality they didn't even know existed before. Why? Because they are a, like all of us, are a state of being aware. The body, as I've been saying for uh, so long, is, is like a biological computer. And when we are experiencing through the body, the body is focusing our attention in that realm of visible light. Uh, and the five senses. So that's basically what we perceive. When near-death experiences, their awareness, their point of attention, withdraws from the lens, the focus, the body. Suddenly, they are um, massively uh, expanded in their awareness of everything. Now, obviously, um, we uh, need this external vehicle to interact with this reality. Otherwise, I couldn't pick that glass up because my awareness is on such a different frequency to that glass that um, it's like two radio stations uh, sharing the same space. They don't interact with each other because they're on different frequencies. So our awareness has this external vehicle within the frequency band that it's experiencing, i.e. this reality, and thus we can interact with it. However, um, 
if our focus of attention is entirely also um, only within this band of frequency, then we are in this world and we are of it. We have no other way of filtering our experience, filtering our sense of reality, except through the five senses. And what information is bombarding the five senses all day, every day? The education system, the mainstream media, uh, science, medicine, corporations through their advertising and stuff. We are uh, isolated in the five senses, if we allow it to happen. And then that isolated sense of awareness is programmed with a perception of reality, a perception of the world, a perception of self. And this isolated awareness um, I call phantom self. The real self is awareness. Phantom self um, is the perception that we are the labels we give ourselves. We are our name, we are our life story, we are our race, we are our culture, we are our religion. Um, they are not who we are. They are what our awareness is experiencing. And that's very, very different. If um, you start to misunderstand uh, the difference between what we're experiencing and what we are, then you get pulled into the world of limitation, the world of I can't, the world of little me. Because when you can only perceive reality through the five senses, all you can see is limitation. You can see reasons why nothing can be done. But then when you, um, you start expanding your awareness um, beyond the five senses, you are now in the world physically, but you're not of the world in the sense of your point of observing the world. And the world starts to look very different. Now, instead of just seeing dots that seem to be unconnected, now you're seeing pictures. Um, and it completely transforms the way you see not only the world, but yourself. Uh, and um, what I've been incredibly encouraged by on this World Speaking Tour um, since last June, June 2016, going to Australia and America and all over Europe is the number of people who are now starting to go through that process uh, and starting to see the world uh, uh, differently. Um, and when they say to me, um, it's obvious, why didn't I see it before? Well, because you were there before. Now you're here. Now you're looking from a different point of uh, uh, observation and thus you're seeing the world uh, differently. And of course, once you start expanding your um, awareness um, into, um, into greater levels of insight, intuition, knowing, seeing through the illusion. That is a nightmare for any uh, force that wants to hold humanity in a, uh, a position of uh, mass enslavement because you can't enslave 7 billion people, quote, physically. Not that there is any physical, I'm sure we'll get into that, but... Um, you can't. There's not enough of you. So what you have to do is you have to hijack their uh, perceptions, their perceptions of reality. And through that, you then start dictating how they see themselves, how they see the world, what they will uh, support, what they won't support, what they will challenge, what they won't uh, challenge. You, you control their lives once you control their perceptions. And absolutely crucial to this is um, the creation of phantom self, the uh, creation of the illusion that what we're experiencing is who we are. U tom kontekstu razmišljanja o fantomskom ja zapravo ključno je pitanje virtualne stvarnosti i zapravo nevjerojatno u kojoj mjeri su recimo prije par godina na jednom znanstvenom kongresu zaključili da 80% su mogućnosti da mi živimo u virtualnom svemiru. Potom su ljudi već davno primijetili da ljudski mozak sustav za obradu informacija i postoje računalna teorija uma o čemu pišete u svojim knjigama i tako dalje. Na kraju krajeva postoji čak i nedavno u časopisu jednom fizikalnom otkrivene broj koje su nekako dio tkanja svemira. So, na koji način danas svijet pomalo stiže do uh, znanstvenih temelja da bi svijet mogao biti simulacija? Well, what's hilarious to me now um, is that um, all those years ago when I was uh, writing and speaking around the world and saying, actually, we live in a holographic simulation. 
Uh, loads of people found that hilarious. This guy's crazy. And now, from all angles, um, mainstream scientists and mainstream scientific studies are concluding we almost certainly live in a simulation. And um, Rich Terrill, who's a NASA computer scientist, came out a few weeks ago now and said, I think we live in a holographic simulation. And of course, the next thing from that is if it's a holographic simulation, some intelligence has created it. So now we're, now we're starting to move, and as he said, it could be extraterrestrials. Um, we're now moving into this realm uh, where even the most far out, perceived far out, of what I was writing and talking about all those years ago is being addressed by so many mainstream scientists. And you know, when you, um, you look at the way we interact with reality, when you, when you go out of the, the norms and the, uh, what we're told about reality by the education system and the media and all that stuff, and you go in and you actually research what we're doing rather than what we're told we're doing, it, it, it's the most obvious um, simulation. How many people know that the uh, physics of computer games are the f same physics of our reality. And let, let's look at that in a, in a simple way. Uh, you now see these um, very sophisticated uh, virtual reality games where they, um, they put on the gloves and the, the headset and the, the audio uh, and they then experience a virtual reality. And if you watch these people while they're experiencing it, they are reacting as if it's real, right? What is a computer game doing? Uh, it's um, hijacking or hacking into the very process through which we create reality. So um, it's hacking into the five senses. Touch through the gloves, uh, sight through the, the headset, uh, audio through the ears. And, and it, that is overriding the uh, reality that we are uh, decoding through the same processes. And suddenly we're seeing a virtual reality experience, which seems incredibly real. Um, the five senses are simply taking waveform information. You think of it as Wi-Fi. Uh, and they're turning it into electrical information, which is delivered to the brain, and the brain turns it into holographic digital information. In terms of visual information, everything we're seeing in this room now, and you could go out on the top of a mountain and look at a vast panorama, doesn't matter. It will all only exist in that form in a few uh, cubic centimeters at the back of the brain. Um, the world we, we perceive to be outside of us is actually inside of us. And it's exactly the same principle as uh, a computer uh, on your desk taking um, electrical um, and uh, uh, digital information and putting it into a reality on the screen. When you look at a computer screen, you'll say, oh, that's a computer. That, 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 that's the Internet. But it only exists in that form on your screen. The Internet doesn't exist like that anywhere else. It's electrical information and other forms of, of, uh, of, of coding. Uh, mathematics, that's what it is. And uh, at one level, I mean, Max Tegmark at the um, Massachusetts Institute of uh, Technology, who's uh, written a book called Our Mathematical Universe, has pointed out, um, as, as indeed I have uh, over, over the years, that on one level of our reality. It's nothing but numbers. That's all it is, numbers. Uh, and uh, this is the level on which the esoteric art of numerology works. They're reading that level, that digital level. And so um, what we're doing um, in uh, creating this reality we think is so real and so solid is, is, as I said, the body's a biological computer. We're pretty much doing in a much more advanced and sophisticated way, what the desktop computer does to the internet. Um, and uh, therefore, we live in a completely different world to the one we think we do. We experience it as out there. We experience it as solid, uh, when all it is is decoded information. 
And uh, when you break it down, um, it's quite blatantly a simulation. This is not a world. This is an information source. The Internet is not a world. It's an information source that appears to be a collective global world in terms of you can log on it anywhere in the world. But what are you logging on to? An information source. What, is, what, what are we logging on to through this biological computer? An information source within a certain narrow band of frequency, which, which gives us the illusion of looking into, into a, a space, even that's an illusion too, um, and believing that we're seeing everything in the space we're looking at, when we're seeing a tiny, tiny fraction of it. So then uh, you start to realize that all these mysteries, uh, esoteric mysteries, uh, mysteries of um, uh, things like, like ghosts and all these uh, esoteric things that uh, science dismisses. And science dismisses them for a simple reason. It can't explain them. And we have this extraordinary arrogance in mainstream science where if they can't explain why it's happening, they conclude it can't be happening. But once you're coming from this direction that I'm coming from and, 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 and quantum physics is coming from, then these mysteries uh, are no longer mysteries um, in the way they were before because we're not dealing with solidity. And, and that takes us into another level of human enslavement. If we're not talking about solidity, we're not talking limitation of solidity either. And so um, once we start to um, understand how reality works, uh, many of the things that we couldn't do if the world was literally solid, we suddenly can do. And um, just a, a few yards from where we're speaking now is the statue of Nikola Tesla. Tesla was saying, I mean, he died in 1943. He was saying um, way back that science has to um, go into the realms of frequency and vibration beyond the world of the scene. And if it did so, it would vastly advance its understanding of reality uh, in a very short time if it would go there. And of course, it, it's struggling to hold its... Uh, line now, but through all the period, most of the period since, um, and still in many cases throughout science today, um, it has, uh, mainstream science has held on to this, the world is solid um, version of everything, when it clearly isn't. And it has to acknowledge that quantum physics exists, which shows it isn't solid. But um, uh, because because quantum physics exists, but what it does, yeah, yeah, quantum physics exists, yeah, 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 and then it cracks on in its own discipline as if it doesn't, and it's it's extraordinary when you think about it. We have a political governmental system all over the world. We have a, a mainstream science outside of quantum physics. We have a medical system and a system of uh, um, treating disease. Uh, we have corporations, we have an educational system, or what claims to be. We have all these institutions that dictate the world, the direction of the world, the laws of the world, the perceptions of the world, and they're all based on the world being solid when it's not, on the world uh, um, being of the illusion of the world we experience, being real when it's not. No wonder the world's a madhouse when the very basis, the very foundation of what we perceive as reality is, is literally inverted in terms of what it really is. And everything's based on that. So how can you, how can you treat a disease uh, most effectively when you don't even know what the body is, when you're treating it as a piece of meat? Um, instead of realizing that its base level is waveform uh, um, energetic information. This is just the holographic projection of that waveform information. This is why more and more mainstream studies, one in Japan recently, uh, only last year, concluded this world's a projection. Yes, it is. And, you know, why can this guy uh, who left school at 15 
never passed a major exam in his life because he didn't take one, went off to kick a ball around, first of all, when I was 15. Uh, this guy who is perceived by so many to be crazy because he's talking outside the box, how could I be writing these things all that time ago um, and now mainstream science is catching up? Why? Because of um, something Tesla said. You can think deeply and be quite insane, but you need to be sane to think clearly. And what Tesla said is that mainstream science thinks deeply, but doesn't think clearly. Um, one of the things I say in a, in a new book I'm writing at the moment is you don't need a scientific mind to understand reality. You need a free one. And the scientific mind can be a massive uh, um, drawback to understanding reality. Because, you know, if you look at a human life, it is a 24-7 uh, almost downloading of a program of perception. Look at it. You come out of the womb and you are um, immediately influenced in your perceptions of the world by your parents who've been through the same programming process you're about to go through and are not passing it on to you through malevolence, but because they think it's real. So immediately you're out the womb and you're already uh, having your perceptions uh, directed and molded by your parents. Then, three, four, sometimes five years only after you enter this reality, you've, you're sitting at a desk and an authority figure called a teacher is telling you at least five times a week, hours and hours a day, what is, what isn't, what's right, what's wrong, what's possible, what's impossible, what's happened, what's not happened. Uh, and in terms of control, they're telling you when you have to be there, when you can leave, when you can eat, when you can talk, when you can go to the toilet. You've only just arrived and this is going on. And then all the way through your formative years, right into your teenage years, this download of the state's version of reality is going on. At the same time, your parents, when you're, when you're younger, are confirming, except those that have expanded their awareness, they are... Um, uh, confirming that what you're being told at school is true. All the people around you, your peers and your friends and your acquaintances, are, are going through the same uh, programming system. Uh, they're confirming to you it's true. Every time you turn on uh, the mainstream media, and much of the alternative, let me say, they are um, uh, telling you the same thing is true. Um, and so on and on and on it goes. And then there's uh, not only the download of... Um, uh, uh, of the perception, there's also the policing of the perception. Um, if you um, challenge what you're being told at school, then you are a disruptive influence in the classroom. If you question what I call the postage stamp consensus, what this, um, this download is telling us to believe in, in terms of its narrowness of possibility, then um, your peers ridicule you or call you crazy because you're challenging this norm. Next stage, you go into the adult world. You go into politics, you go into journalism, you go into medicine, you go into science, you go into the corporate world. You go into education to be a teacher or, or an academic. And what are you taking in to those institutions? The core programming that you've been downloading since the day you were born, actually before, in the womb, through the mother as well, perception programming. And, and then... You've got these institutions, therefore, that are directing society and are telling society what is and isn't. The new teacher, once you get into the adult world, um, they are confirming to each other that actually this ludicrously narrow sense of reality and norm, normal, is real. So a journalist um, will, uh, if he's c covering or he or she is covering a, a medical story, they won't go to an alternative practitioner who's coming from a different view of reality. They'll go to a doctor and they'll get the, 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 they'll get the, um, the song sheet. They want to talk about reality, they'll go to a scientist and get the song sheet. 
Um, same with all these things. And so um, all the way through your life, you are being bombarded with a sense of normality and a sense of the possible and a sense of reality, which is so powerful in controlling people's perceptions that people have laughed at me over the years for saying things that science, even mainstream science, has proved to be true. But because that's not appeared in the mainstream uh, of, of uh, where they get their information from, they don't know it's been proved to be true. And thus, if I'm saying it, it's got to be crazy. Because, I, you know, I never went to, to school. Thank you, God. And, and this is the other thing about this program. The further you go in it, the more programmed you become to this perception of normal, this ludicrously narrow uh, sense of normal. And who goes further into it? Those that go on to be scientists, that go on to be doctors, that go on to then tell us what normal is. You know, there's a, a professor in Britain who's famous for trashing anything alternative, um, who wrote a book and said that um, reality is not malleable, it's, it's basically solid, when it blatantly isn't. And then in the same book, he says that his, um, his knowledge of quantum physics is, quote, a bit foggy. This is what you're dealing with. You're dealing with people who were so programmed uh, with the um, official <coughs> version of normal, they cannot literally think outside of it. So, as Tesla said, they can think deeply within the program, but they th can't think clearly, so they see beyond the program. And that's why we need uh, free minds looking at this, not scientific minds. They're never going to suss it. Uh, kada ste već spominjali obrazovanje, uh, treba reći da i mjere koje se provlači kroz obrazovanje su sve oštrije, znači u Americi i u Velikoj Britaniji već postoje uh, one odgojiteljice koje moraju prijavljivati djecu ako misle da bi mogli biti teroristi, postoje samice za satapeciranje zidovima za djecu, uh, postoje uh, kazne za roditelje koji recimo zbog nekih neopravdanih izostanaka i to je sad jedna druga priča za koju je teško je obuhvatiti ako pokušavamo pričati o stvarnosti. No u svakom slučaju kao što ste rekli, evo ja ću pročitati jedan citat u kojem je James Gates iz, u časopisu Physic World objasnio kako je otkrio sa svojim timom jednadžbe u tkanju svemira kodove digitalnih podataka koje poprimaju oblik i koji su zapravo e, binarni sustav uključenog i isključenog električnog napona. Rekao je da ne zna što oni rade u strukturi naše stvarnosti. E, no, to nas naravno vodi na ovu priču koju ste malo prije govorili, da je sve obrnuto, pa se pozbavimo malo onim što se obično naziva paranormalno. Znači, paranormalno je u stvari e, normalno iz te perspektive i unutar toga se ističe recimo biolog Rupert Sheldrick sa svojim mnogobrojnim knjigama, on je također bio gost ove emisije, koji je doveo u pitanje sve teze da je priroda mehanička, da je materija nesvjesna, da su zakoni prirode fiksni, da je ukupna količina materije i energije ista, da je priroda nesvrhovita i tako dalje. On je u stvari krenuo pod potvrđivati te teze, na kraju je ustanovio da su sve do jedne pogrešne. Međutim, teza na para normalno je normalno, jer neke se ističu koje su bitne za našu priču, to je recimo ideja e, električnog svemira. No, možete je proširiti i na neke druge ako e, imate inspiraciju. Anything outside of what I call the postage stamp normal is referred to as paranormal. Uh, it's not paranormal, it's para postage stamp normal. That's all it is. Um, and it's like Tesla said, when you go into the realms of frequency and vibration, you go um, into those realms from which this world is a projection. And thus you can see um, uh, and explain things within the projection that if you think the projection is all there is, and it's solid, etc., you'll never explain them. So Just take a few paranormal things. Um, ghosts. Uh, well, if you have um, two radio stations, one's the dominant one and one's an interfering station, the interfering station is nothing like as uh, sharp as the main station, but you can still hear it. You can still perceive it. If you look at that in terms of uh, a visual experience, you've got The, the prime station, this is this visible light realm that we uh, occupy, this narrow band of frequency. 
And anything that, that gets close to it, but is not in it, will not look solid because we're not uh, decoding it in a sharp way that makes it appear solid, solidly holographic. So it's ethereal. It's ethereal. We perceive ghosts as ethereal because they're not on the same frequency we are. If they were on the same frequency we are, they'd look as solid as you and me. Then you go to psychics, for instance. What are they doing? Well, we operate within a certain band of frequency. Our brain operates within a certain band of frequency. Provable fact, mainstream science. And, and what psychics are able to do, and mediums, the, the good ones, there's loads that call themselves psychics and mediums who are just kidding themselves as well as other people, but, but the good ones. They're e able to expand their, their awareness, their frequency, further into the field, into other levels of awareness that are not in the world of our scene. <coughs> and they are therefore able to tap into information and insight and bring it down into this world or into this information source, what it is, um, in a way that many others can't, but a way in which everyone is supposed to. See, the, when you focus attention, as the system does, um, through the five senses and only in the realm of the five senses, you are focusing attention on a narrow band of frequency. What is that doing? That's disconnecting you from a, a, an awareness of the wider frequency. You see, um, why do, um, do, do animals uh, know when an earthquake's coming? Why do they know when there's a storm coming before humans do? Because they haven't been to school they don't read the local newspaper and, and, and watch the mainstream media. Um, they've not got peer pressure all the time that we've, di we've discussed to desensitize them from the wider field and focus them only at a, at, a, at a tiny band of it. So when, because everything is energy in the end, everything is waveform energy in its base form, just like Wi-Fi, think Wi-Fi fields. Um, when um, an earthquake is uh, in the process of unfolding or a storm, it doesn't just happen. Oh, it's an earthquake. There's a process. Like with a storm, there's a process. And what that process is doing is changing, making subtle, even in earthquake terms, less than subtle, changes to the, to the um, uh, energetic field or fields. Now, animals, um, even insects, um, are able to, 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 to feel and be sensitive to those changes so they know something's coming. Humans are so um, insensitive to these changes because of this five sense focus of attention that they only know there's an earthquake when the earth moves. They only know when there's a, um, a storm coming when they see it. Um, and therefore, we've become massively desensitized from these things. But we're all meant to be multidimensional uh, um, awareness that interacts with uh, uh, other levels of awareness. But we've been uh, manipulated not to. Why? When you um, start to expand your awareness into the greater field, you're expanding your awareness into greater understanding, into greater insight, into greater knowledge. And that's the last thing that uh, the few seeking to uh, enslave and direct billions want you to do. They want you isolated in a sense of little me, in a sense of everything's apart from everything else, rather than we're all expressions of the same awareness, having different experiences. And so the system has been set up to pressure people from the earliest age to sense and self-identify themselves with the labels of experience rather than the infinite, eternal totality of who we really are. Um, and once you enter the realm of the five senses, and that's where science is, quantum physics apart, that's where medicine is, almost entirely medicine, um, you, um, you can only see what you can see. You can only perceive what your five senses can uh, draw to you in terms of um, experience and everything beyond it is lost to you therefore you, you, you can't get this greater insight from uh, awareness beyond the world of the scene you're isolated now if you, if you want to control people do you want them communing with each other symbolically 
and sharing their experience so everyone uh, has uh, the benefit of other people's insights? Or do you want them isolated from each other? So they're, they're not sharing information. They're, uh, the only information they receive is the information they've got themselves. Of course, you want the latter because then people uh, are in ignorance of what there is to know. And if they're ignorance, in ignorance of what there is to know, they're in ignorance of, um, of almost everything. And the human disease is ignorance. And I don't say that in a condemnatory way. It's a, it's a fact. Um, and they're ignorant of so much because the system has made them ignorant. This is why the narrow band of postage stamp normal is all you get through the education system. It's all you get through the mainstream media. It's all you get from all these forms of communication. And um, I would say to people, um, you know, ignorance is still a choice. They're trying to make it no longer a choice by suppressing alternative information. And they're trying very, very hard to do that now. But still now, as we speak, ignorance is a choice. It's not like, um, you know, you're, you're in a situation like China, for instance, where they firewall off great swathes of the Internet that they don't want you to see. Then ignorance is not so much a choice. It's a it's a it's a, um, a, a, a an ignorance that's imposed. Uh, but if people want to know um, what is possible and what's going on beyond what they're told by the mainstream everything. Um, it's there still for now in books and in, um, on the Internet and videos, etc., where they can see it. But see, what they're doing now with the Internet is trying to firewall off people in the same way as the Chinese do, but in a more subtle way. So um, in China, there's great chunks of the Internet that you can't access. What they're doing now with the monsters that are Facebook, Google and all these other Internet giants, which in the end are, are controlled by the same network, is they are ensuring that basically as much as possible, you only see what you already believe. They do this by uh, algorithms. Uh, they um, chart your surfing history. They chart what kind of subjects you watch on YouTube and uh, what you say on Facebook. And then the next time you go in, you are offered a series of videos or a series of stories that relate to your surfing background. In fact, it's been exposed that when you're on Facebook, um, on the phone, your, um, your conversations are being uh, recorded and scanned by algorithms. And they found this out by people having conversations about various subjects. And when they next went into Facebook, they were being offered advertisements for the subjects, not that they'd been surfing, but they'd been discussing between each other. Um, and what that means is that you have a certain belief system and when you go into the web, as much as possible, they're offering you only that belief system. They don't want you to see something, if you like, by accident that might make you think, oh, God, what's that? Oh, I, d I didn't know that. Hey, come and look at this. They don't want that. And this is what's being done by algorithms now. There's this, um, this war on, on expanded perception going on, um, and uh, it's, it's moving very fast. Why? Because they, ha they know, and my goodness me, on this world tour, I've seen it. They know that people are now starting to uh, wake up to uh, at least look at things more dispassionately that are outside the box, and they would have waved away by reflex action before, and they're desperately trying to keep the lid on this or put the lid on this. Uh, by all these methods we're talking about. Kada već pričamo znači o umjetnoj stvarnosti i kako je ona učitana, u knjizi spominjete da je zapravo postojala jedna stvarnost, to se zapravo čini logičnim jer naša percepcija jest jedna stvarnost i očigledno sad imamo neke hakere koji tu kontroliraju politiku i sve to. Zanimljivo je što obično, mada je vaša središnja tema upravo priroda stvarnosti, često vas povezuju i po internetu, a de vi dajte one koji vjeruju u gmazove. No, zanimljivo je kad već se bavimo stvarima iz jednog novog kuta 
kojim se do sad nismo bili naučeni gledati, obratiti pažnju na neke povijesne dokumente koji u stvari se mogu nadovezati, mada su povijesni, na ovu sasvim modernu tehnološku priču koja će nas kasnije s vremenom dovesti i do transhumanizma i drugog. Stoga bih vas zamolio da ispričate što to knjižnica u Nah Hamadi ugovori i što su ta gnostička učenja pokazala, dakle dokumenti koji su jednostavno bili nađeni onakvi kakvi su bili zapisani i na koji način oni možda kriju ključ tajne od kuda i što se zapravo dekodira s obzirom da naravno kao što ste rekli ako neka stvarnost je virtualna i kodirana i ako postoji elita koja čuva znači netko mora nad tim informacijama imati nazor pitanje je od kad i kako a možda ćemo doći na to i zašto drugim rečima što te najstarije knjižnice koje su uvele izraz Arconi koji danas kruži zapravo nama govore Yeah, you see, uh, when you think of the narrow band of sense of the possible within what I call the postage stamp normal, when I'm talking about a non-human force manipulating human society from the unseen, and of course the unseen, as we've discussed, is almost the entirety of reality that we can't see, uh, that, that, you know, blows a lot of people's minds. Um, but you see, it's not, It's not me they should be looking at when they laugh and dismiss. They should be finding themselves a mirror. And they should ask themselves why they find uh, this so funny and not credible. Without an ounce of research, by the way, and as um, Einstein said, uh, condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. Um, because let's just break this down. We can see a laughably uh, small fraction of reality, visible light. Laughable, it's so tiny. Uh, beyond what we see is the entirety of existence. So, do you think, what do you think? Do you think there's a, a chance that in almost the entirety of existence there might be intelligent life that doesn't look human? Do you think there might be a chance of that? Um, when you see the diversity of form there is in the human world that we see, what diversity of form must there be outside of it? I mean, hello? Then, uh, from the projected size of the universe, according to mainstream science, planet Earth in size is the equivalent of a billionth of a pinhead. Do you think there might be a chance, what do you think, that there might be life that doesn't look human within the entirety of uh, the universe apart from a billionth of a pinhead? It's insane. See, this is it. They're laughing at the wrong person. They ought to be laughing at the mirror and asking it why uh, their perception of the possible is so uh, focused on a tiny range of possibility that their instant reaction is to laugh at anything that's outside of it. You know, look the other way. I don't care if you laugh at me. I have no interest to in me. But, you know, a bit of advice. Ask why you're laughing, given the kinds of things that I'm saying now about the chances. Then you go to ancient cultures all over the world who, although they use different names for obvious reasons, all describe a force in the hidden, the almost entirety of reality we can't see, um, that is manipulating human affairs. Right across. And, 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 and often they are describing this force in similar terms. I mean, the, the, you mentioned the Archons, the Gnostic people, uh, who um, uh, operated in, um, in Egypt and in southern France as the Cathars, who had a certain belief system about this reality, which I go into in the books, um, they uh, described uh, this force as archons, which is, uh, comes from a word meaning rulers. And um, how they describe these archons is the same way that the Islamic world and the pre-Islamic world, which is where it came from, described the jinn, for which we get the term uh, genie. Uh, the uh, Islamic world says of the jinn that they're made from smokeless fire. The Gnostics say of the archons they're made from luminous fire. You see these common themes. 
Um, then, um, if you um, look at the way ancient cultures and the shamans of those cultures were describing this force, they obviously they can't describe the they can't describe something in their own uh, historical setting in terms of computers, in terms of simulations. We have that ability because we have that technology around us now and thus we have the analogies. It makes it much easier for people like me to describe what I'm saying because we have the technological analogies and we have Wi-Fi and we have computers. But in those times, they didn't. So they had to describe this in the language of the day. When you transcribe the language of the day across to modern technology, they're describing a simulation. That's what they're describing. And they're describing a force that created the simulation. Um, and what, is people, what are people like Rich Turrell, the NASA computer scientist, saying? That he's now convinced we live in a holographic simulation uh, that had to therefore be created by, by some intelligence. So when you put the dots together, you start to see the forest, you start to see the picture. But when you're only looking at dots uh, in isolation, then you can't see the picture. How can you? And what? look at the five sense mind, which we are manipulated from cradle to grave to stay in. Um, how does it perceive the world? In dots, as everything apart from everything else. Um, and thus, um, it's isolated from that level of itself, not least in the right side of the brain, which sees, which sees pictures, not pixels, which sees forests, not twigs. Um, and and uh, it's systematic. Uh, you look at um, the work of Silas Bean, the physicist Silas Bean, and his, um, his team uh, at um, the University of Bonn, which have been uh, investigating whether we live in a simulation and concluding we almost certainly do, and that it, it, even down to, they suggest, it's actually made of a lattice of, of cubes, um, and uh, they are um, outside the box, not because uh, they um, have decided that that's where they're going to go, but the information that they've uncovered from the studies they've done have taken them outside the box. Um, and, and if we, um, you know, w when the, uh, the Gnostics, who were like the Gnostic Cathars in southern France, the Gnostics in Egypt, who were destroyed by the Roman Catholic Church, uh, who, whenever the, the Gnostic belief system got a grip in any society, uh, the, 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 the Roman Church uh, threw, uh, sent the boys in to, to destroy them, as they did the Cathars in um, the siege of Montségur in 1244. Um, the Gnostics, in their language, were describing a virtual reality, which they said, this force had created to enslave humanity. They were um, describing uh, the way that what we perceive as the physical world is this manufactured illusion to hold us in servitude to, uh, to, to ignorance and, and to therefore keep us under control. How they, 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 but but they, they, they were describing uh, um, a, uh, a simulation in my words, that they called Hal, because uh, they, they were written in Coptic Egyptian. And Hal, so the translators tell me, um, is their way of talking about virtual reality. Uh, and, and so when you look at the ancient and you look at the modern and you take into account that the ancient had to describe these concepts in the language of the day, then you can start to see that the two correlate. They're describing the same thing. And what's happened is five sense obsessed anthropologists and historians, etc., have gone into these ancient societies and they've, they've taken the stories literally. They've taken the uh, descriptions literally and thought, oh, they're primitive people. They are. No, they're talking symbolically because that's all they had to describe these things. They couldn't talk about simulations and computers and information sources and biological computers. We can. And, and, and this is why 
uh, we are in a position now of enormous danger, but enormous opportunity. Um, the opportunity is we have the uh, analogies now, which are not even analogies. They're so close to literally the same with our computer systems and our Wi-Fi that relate to the reality we're actually experiencing. I mean, you know, you, you, you listen to people at the cutting edge of uh, virtual reality and they'll tell you it's not going to be long before virtual reality, even with our computation power, uh, is going to be indistinguishable from the reality we're experiencing as the world. The great danger is this, and it's a great danger. And if people listen to nothing I've said in this interview, please give this bit a chance. In, um, in my latest book, just come out in Croatia, um, Phantom Self, there's a chapter which I call Transphantomism. And clearly it has a relationship to transhumanism. We've discussed how um, humanity has been controlled and herded into a tiny fraction of perception uh, called a visible light and, and uh, the five senses um, through um, the creation of phantom self, which is the perception that all the labels we give ourselves is who we are. We are now at the point where they're going to where they were always going all along. But they had to manipulate humanity's uh, knowledge, not wisdom, knowledge, to the point where we could build our own technological prison. And we're there. Uh, and uh, transphantomism is taking this control and isolation of our perception into the technological world. They want to put technology inside us that will be connected to artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence will then provide our perceptions, our thinking, and our emotional reactions. The human will be gone. Now, don't listen to me. Listen to the global sales pitcher of transhumanism, a Google executive, the monster that is Google, called um, Ray Kurzweil. He is now openly saying, and it, it is claimed that over the years where he's made his predictions about the technological advancement and its effect on humanity, he's been about 80% true, correct up to this point, even in his time scale. He is saying that by 2030, we are speaking in 2017, humans will be connected technologically to what he calls the cloud. Uh, and this is not me um, over here in a conversation or anything and, and, and exposing it. This is him speaking publicly. And that um, from the point of connection, uh, gradually and not so gradually, uh, the artificial intelligence in the cloud, as he calls it, will do more and more of human thinking until there's no human thinking left. That There is words. Now, why are these people like him openly coming out and saying this? You'd think they wouldn't want us to know. Uh, actually, they do because of the sales pitch. The sales pitch is we must um, become technologically attached to artificial intelligence so that we become superhuman. No, no. So we become subhuman, and people like Kurzweil know it. Uh, then you've got uh, others like um, Elon Musk, a co-founder of PayPal, and uh, now a billionaire in high technology. He's, through his SpaceX company, he sends up satellites uh, around the Earth to beam Wi-Fi at the Earth, and that's another major story about why they're doing that. It's all part of this transhumanism and this creation of this artificial intelligence cloud. Uh, and if you're going to have this cloud uh, encompassing the entirety of the human race, so there's no escape from it, then you have to have, have it beam from, um, from satellite. And uh, people have no idea uh, the scale of what is happening in the, in the heavens around the earth. Uh, there was a story a few weeks back of um, an Indian um, uh, rocket taking up 140 satellites in one launch. 
That's what's going on uh, all around us. They're creating this cloud from which humanity uh, will not be able to escape once we are technologically connected to it. And the idea uh, um, that Elon Musk is talking about, uh, Elon Musk who has said um, that there's only a one in billions chance that we don't live in a simulation, that, oh, AI is bad. Well, why are you putting satellites in the sky for then to advance it? He says, he says um, AI is bad, but there's no escape from it. Um, it's like the Borg in Star Trek, resistance is futile. Um, because uh, unless we connect to AI, AI will become far more intelligent than us and it will take us over. Well, if we become attached to it, it'll take us over. Uh, and you're seeing this, this push now for transhumanism. Now, we've talked before in these interviews about the various techniques of human uh, manipulation. And one of them uh, I've been calling now for 20 odd years, the totalitarian tiptoe, where you start at A and you know you're going to Z, but you go in steps, not in enormous leaps, because you don't want to alert the target population to the fact that you're going in a particular direction. You want to promote every step as in isolation and in and of itself. But there's a very clear totalitarian tiptoe in relation to um, transhumanism. First of all, you get them addicted to technology that they hold, to smartphones, to tablets, to this kind of technology. Now, that has basically been achieved. Now, because I've been traveling around the world, talking in different countries and different cultures uh, for the last nearly a year, um, I can tell you that um, when you walk down the street, almost anywhere, um, that addiction to uh, smart technology can be clearly seen. Conversation is dying. Uh, family interaction is dying. Pe people in ridiculous numbers are texting each other in the same house, a family. Um, it's an addiction. And, and this can be shown by uh, studies of the brain. They've even now coined a phrase for it. It's a very good one, digital heroin. Because they once believed that once the brain was formed, it never changed. Now they realize that's nonsense, that the brain is constantly changing. And what's changing it is information received. As data is um, uh, decoded by a computer, the computer is changing. As the brain, which is a part of the biological computer, is uh, processing information, it's changing. This is clearly shown. And what is happening to the brain is it's becoming addicted to the electrical stimulus of smart technology. Uh, so, um, if you put the phone down, and m m many people rarely do, then basically the brain goes into an electronic stimulation cold turkey. It wants its stimulation. So, they pick the phone up. They're not doing anything with it, but they've got the phone. Now, what this has done, again, another uh, uh, point that's been shown in studies, this has... Uh, reduced uh, dramatically the human attention span. Many humans now have the attention span of a, of a goldfish. Um, you, you pick up a book, you get two, two, two uh, pages into the book. No, no, I no, I don't want that one. Electronic stimulation or something on the... Uh, and so it goes on. Um, and so this addiction not only is obvious, how it's come about is clear. So, stage one of the totalitarian tiptoe is you get people addicted to technology they hold. Then you go to the next stage, which is what they're calling wearables. This is Google Glass, this is Bluetooth, this is smart watches. It's technology on the body. They want to get inside, but they're on the body now. And look, look how, how widespread that is now. The next one, and this is already happening, is what they call implantables. And if people read my books from 1994... And before 93, they'll see me saying, this is the plan, getting technology inside people, what they now call implantables. It's happening. It's, it's not something that's happening by organic 
uh, unfolding. It's happening by cold calculated design and it goes way back for the reasons that I uh, have, have explained and can explain at length. Um, so um, we're now there where people are now, oh, you know, they're lining up to be plugged into AI. Oh, have you seen the latest? All you know, these people who um, they they line up in the in the in the in the dead of the morning, so that they can be the first person to get the new Apple phone or something. It's madness. Um, and and then they go on to the next one. Oh yeah, well, you know the latest. You put it inside you. Oh, no need for. It's like it's like uh, with 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 payment. You start with cash, and then you go to credit card, and now it's just doing that with a smartphone. You, they're moving us along to it, and the idea is that um, we, uh, as 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 old as Huxley said in Brave New World, who wasn't coming purely from his, his imagination. He was he was an insider. He he knew what the plan was. So did. Um, uh, uh, George Orwell, who was taught French at Eton College, the elite college where the Royals go to in England by, um, by Aldous Huxley. Um, they, were, they were coming from a, a, a knowledge of what the plan was. This is why they've been so remarkably accurate in, in the way they uh, talked about uh, this dystopian society. And so the, the, the idea is that um, people, as Huxley talked about, welcome and love their servitude and love the technologies that enslave them. And I, I'll say this, you know, uh, if, if, if anyone has technology put inside them to connect them to AI, bye-bye, nice knowing you. Because very soon, very soon, you will not be the person you were before. You'll be an AI um, uh, computer terminal on an AI internet. David, evo, za drugi nastavak emisije ćemo staviti neke detalje vezane uz pitanja zašto, kako i slično. Ovaj put, u ovom prilikom ćemo završiti sa ovim rečima pa do sljedećeg tjedna. Doviđenja.